She has power. So, happy Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving. I'm so happy I've got my family seated here with me. My youngest daughter, Elizabeth, is home from university along with her best friend and roommate. And my sister's flying in at 11 o'clock from Australia. And then we have 14 people around our dining room table or... I think picnic tables at lunchtime. So I believe that Thanksgiving really is a time for remembering. It's a time to be thankful. It, and perhaps it's even a time to adjust our perspective. Uh, this past week, I most certainly needed my perspective to be adjusted. I was personally spent. You know that time when you just feel like you've got nothing left in your tank? And I was there, I had been going hard and I was feeling overwhelmed. And Dean had gone out and he had purchased a new shelving unit uh, for our storage space. And my very much self-appointed job, because Dean was quite willing to do it, was to make it fit into our storage room. And the task was not on my to-do list for the day, and I very much am a list girl. If it's on my list, it will get done. If it's not on my list, I, it tips over my bucket, and I, I begin to uh, melt down a bit. And I had a very bad attitude. I was down in the basement making my frustrations known to the household. You know when you're so frustrated you want others to join in and at least know that you're frustrated? And I'm down there and I'm ramming and I'm jamming stuff. And our daughter, Isabel, heard my commotion and she decided bravely to come down and to see what was going on. And Isabel is an absolutely delightful human being. And she set up a full bucket list of things she wanted to accomplish in the fall. And one of the things on her list was she wanted to write out a gratitude list. She wanted to list everything that she was thankful for. And sort of serendipitously, she had just completed her list when she heard me down there huffing and puffing and ramming and jamming. Uh, she came down the stairs, and having just written a gratitude list, her headspace, she was in a great space. She came down, and she's just like, well, this is easy, Mom. This is the solution. This is how we do it. Whereas me, I could see no, no solutions. Everything was dark. Everything was a problem. Nothing was going to work. How come I was doing this anyway? You see, I think we all get ourselves stuck sometimes. And unable to come out of situations simply because we have bad attitudes. And perspectives that have become clouded in with the dark storms of life. And all we see is the negative. The problem is what gets magnified. So today, being Thanksgiving, let's start new. Let's wipe some slates clean. Let's determine perhaps to adjust our perspective. And if you know how to sing and you know the lyrics to this song, please drown out my voice. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. It's going to be a bright, 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 sunshiny day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> A week or so ago, our eldest daughter, Victoria, was a guest speaker at a Women in Leadership uh, conference in Saskatoon. And in her message, she quoted two people 
that really got me thinking and really helped lay a foundation for today's message. Yvonne Poitras Pratt is a Métis author and professor. And she's quoted as having said, within each person lies a story that has the power to change their lives. And if shared, the po potential to transform the world of others. Within each one of us, there is a story or there are stories that if we share them, that they have the potential to change the atmosphere around us. She quoted another man, Thomas King, who is often described as one of the finest contemporary indigenous writers in North America. And he said, the truth about stories is, that's all we are. That's all we are. I'm just a compilation of my life stories. These are powerful statements that got me thinking. Who are we? Who are you? What are your stories? What's your story? And whose life can be changed by us simply sharing our story? I submit to you that no matter what you are going through, you are not alone. Someone else has gone through it. And someone else's life can be changed by you being brave enough to simply share your story. Last week, Pastor Joel talked about the importance of giving courage, encouraging one another. And we can do that very simply by telling our story. I love how scripture talks about how we were made. That we were knit together in our mother's womb. That every single one of us was created for a purpose. That we are fearfully, that we are wonderfully made. No matter what circumstance has tried to drown that out. We are all uniquely shaped. And when I say shaped, I break it down as an acrostic shape. S for spiritual gifts, every single one of us have spiritual gifts being realized and expressed. We have a heart, we have a, a passion within us. We have abilities that are unique to us. We have a personality and we have experiences. Basically, I think that it's the E, the experiences that have shared have a, a, a possibility to bring hope, to expand, and to infuse courage. It is our stories that make us come alive, that make us real. This book, this book is filled with stories because if you hear the stories, you get to know the person. When you hear each other's stories, you get to know the person. And when you read this book, you get to understand the person of Christ and the character of God. I spoke with a young person this week, and I was curious about their faith journey. Because they were talking to me, and they said they didn't necessarily grow up in a God-believing home. But they told me that they were given an assignment to begin to read the Bible. And they began to read the Bible and they could not put it down. They were drawn to the stories that revealed the character of God. And now they've come to a place where they absolutely hunger and thirst for his righteousness. And they want to live their call. There is life-changing power 
in our stories. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 and 5 says, Praise be to the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our trials, that we may be able to comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves were when we were comforted by God. Or as Yvonne Poitras Pratt said, within us lies a story that if we share it and we tell what God has done, it has the power to infuse hope. It is through the stories that life is given and imparted. The God of all comfort who comforts us repeatedly comforts Catherine. Then me using my story to bring comfort to those he puts in my path. Revelations 12, 11 says, They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. There is something transformingly powerful when we begin to testify and begin to share our stories about the faithfulness, the faithfulness of God. So this morning, I want to open by having you look inward and really think about who you are, what's your story, and what has God done for you? What have you seen God do? Can you remember? Do you remember? Or has your perspective been clouded? Even in preparing today's message, I've been thinking about these questions in my own life. What has God done for me? And as I thought about that, immediately I remembered back to something that happened that I haven't thought about for over 25, 27 years. One day I was out with my daughter Victoria and she was riding her tricycle and Dean and I were living in Hong Kong at the time and Victoria was showing me how she could ride her tricycle and a bus pulled up and off the bus came one of her friends. She got off her tricycle and she ran towards the bus and as she ran towards the bus, a window fell from the 10th story of the building and crashed onto her tricycle. My God is faithful. My God goes before me. My God comes behind me. I remember when the girls were heading off to university. And, and, men, and some of you in this room know this story, but I asked God, I said, God, we're, we're in a tight financial situation. How are we going to make this happen? So I said, God, I'm going to stretch it out, Joel. I'm going to stretch it out. I'm going to believe God to give me $20,000. Lord, would you just supernaturally give us $20,000? And we put our work to it. We applied for scholarships. And uh, yes, God showed himself faithful again. Our youngest is finishing her final year of university. God brought in the $20,000 in scholarships. But people, he didn't stop there. Collectively, our girls have received over $200,000 of scholarships. Our God goes before. Our God surrounds us. He gives us. He hears us. He responds to us. And I love to tell this story because my prayer is that you would be inspired. I didn't even think about scholarships until I attended Tom Collegiate's graduation one time and I saw this kid getting a scholarship for $100,000. And I'm like, wow, I was inspired. I heard this story and it changed the way I approached and the way I even approached God and what I asked him for. You see the question also, what have I seen God do? I've seen undeniable, in fact, documented miracles. Our friend, their daughter had a gangrenous lung, 
lung that needed to be surgically removed. Dean and I remember calling out to God, that our friends getting baptized in the Holy Spirit and beginning to believe God. And as we shared our stories, faith began to rise within them. Their daughter went in for surgery and she's lying on the gurney and they said the lung is new, it is healed. There is nothing impeded in that lung. And today, two very healthy lungs. You see, this is an exciting, abundant life that we need to remember. I was talking to a friend of mine recently. She's only in her 20s. And they are, or they were, they are, they're going through a bit of a faith wander. They're trying to figure out exactly what they believe. And they said something to me that stuck in my mind. They said something like, despite all of my wandering, I have seen too much of God. I have experienced too much to deny God's existence. The stories, their stories, are a place marker in their lives, an anchor that keeps pulling them in and grounding them. I have some great relationships in my life and my friends are faithful in reminding me of the things that I have gone through, the things that I have overcome, and the way that God has repeatedly shown up for me. I have a list. If your list is short, get around people. Start hearing their stories. Start telling your stories. And something will ignite within you. We all have them. It is who we are. All that we are is our stories. But it's what we do with them that makes the difference. I remember being in a service, not unlike this one. And the preacher was talking about how sin separates us from God. And that he went on to say that God loved us so much that he sent his son for us to be the atonement to our sin. And that through the death and resurrection of Christ that I could have forgiveness of my sin. And I could have an assurance of everlasting life. And as the preacher told his story about how he came to this realization... And he simply asked Christ into his heart. He said, cleanse me, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And how he became a new person that day. The old had passed away and the new had begun to grow within him. And as the preacher shared his story, my story began. I heard his story and something inside me clicked. Sort of like when Elizabeth came to Mary and told her she was pregnant and something, right? God infused connection. And I simply, by just putting up my hand and saying, your story is my story. And I need forgiveness. My life changed on that day. Perhaps you're here today and you too are looking for a fresh start. If that's you, come up to me after service and I want to pray with you much in the same way that preacher prayed for me. I have been in a season of reflection, especially over the last couple of weeks, because I've been working really, really hard. All of my spare time has been spent out on the land that my parents left my siblings and I. It's six miles north of Wolseley, Saskatchewan, right on the edge of the Quapel Valley. There's about 30 acres of arable land, and the rest of it is coulee land. Here's a picture. Do we have a picture up there? Oh, that's me standing looking out over our land. And I love this piece of land. Not only because it's absolutely beautiful, but because it represents something to me. 
It's my family heritage. You see, my parents bought our farm when I was about 10 years old. And although they sold the farmhouse and the land a while back, they kept this little pocket for us. Even in their will, they made a statement of intent. And although they cannot legally direct future generations, they were clear that their desire is that this land not be sold, but be enjoyed for generations to come. This piece of land was also the land that my maternal grandmother grew up on. And it's just across the valley from my, where my granddad Garden lived. So there is history, there is heritage, and it's a grounding place for our extended family. As I said, I've been working hard out there the last couple of weeks because I want to make it special for my brother and sister, for my husband and I, and my sister-in-law, and for my girls and their cousins, and for all of the descendants to come. I wanted to make it a place where we can come together and remember. You see, the last few years, I've told you, have been tough. My mom passed, and then we lost my brother last year, and he left behind four children who were just beginning to hit their stride as young adults. And I think much of my labor of love in the last couple of weeks, which was simply restoring and refurbishing a shed, which became our Cooley's family Cooley cabin, it was perhaps even me building an altar of remembrance. It's a sh simple shed, do we have it? That I wanted to make special. I furnished it with pictures of my parents, my siblings, and all of the cousins. I told my nephew Tristan that I transformed it from a, from a flop shack to a lovely little sanctuary where each of us can go. I wanted it to be a lovely retreat in a place of thanksgiving and remembrance so my nieces and my nephews and my sister will see it for the first time this afternoon. Do you see the inside? Woo! <laughs> I'm so excited. They don't know what's about to come. So I'm glad to see they're not in service this morning. Not really, but. <laughs> this morning I want us to explore and perhaps return to a place where we're not only just thankful, but we, we remember what we're thankful for. And we remember who we are and we remember what God has done. Throughout scripture we see the establishment of altars of remembrance where people took stones and built an altar after a significant event in their lives. A place of remembrance where they could see and it was substantial and they'd say, this is the God. This is the God who did this for me. This is the God who did that for you. This is the God of my family. This is the God of my people. I want to begin by asking you a question. If, if a fire raged through your home, and you saved your pets and your family, what would you run back in for? Anyone know what they'd run back in for? Pictures. I heard this on Family Feud. The number one answer of 100 people was they'd run back in for their photos. People want to save their family photos. Why? Because a picture taken even decades ago reminds us, oh, I remember that day. And when you remember, something begins to swell within you. And one fond memory often leads to another. And like Isabel's gratitude list, that she, she came into a situation prepared and positioned with her heart. Memories can do that for us. The root of the word remember is to keep in mind or to be mindful. The word remember is used 352 times in the Bible. And if you 
include variations of the word, it jumps to 550 times. God obviously places importance on us being purposeful in remembering. Many times in the Old Testament, God instructed his people to build a stone altar, stone memorial and altars of remembrance to permanently mark a place where God made himself real, where his promises or his power were manifest. <clears throat> Basically, people repeatedly built an altar to remember how God showed up in an extraordinary way. A few examples of stone altars being built were Moses, Jacob, Joshua. In Exodus 24, we see Moses has a substantial meeting with God. And after receiving and recording the laws and the covenants, it says that after this monumental time, in verse 4, it says that Moses got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. In Genesis 28, it tells the story how Jacob fell asleep and in a dream he saw angels and the Lord spoke to him in the dream it was in that dream that God told Jacob that all the peoples of the earth would be blessed through his offspring in the dream God spoke to Jacob and he said I am with you I will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised the next morning, Jacob awoke, and it is recording as saying how he is recorded as saying, How awesome is this place! Surely the Lord is here. So, what did Jacob immediately do? He took a rock, he set it up as a pillar, he poured oil over it, and he called the place Bethel, meaning the house of God. You see, when God begins to do something, and we begin to remember, and we begin to establish altars of remembrance, even a new identity comes across our land. You see, Joshua 4 recounts the story of Joshua as he was leading the Israelites. They came to the Jordan River and they needed to cross it to go into battle at Jericho. And the river was at a very swollen flood stage. And as soon as the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, as soon as their foot touched into the water, God stopped the flow of the water and the water stacked up like a wall. So making a way for the warriors and the nation of Israel to cross over. You see, after this life altering event, God told Joshua, go choose 12 men to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And Joshua took those 12 men and said, pick up a stone. Let's build a memorial. Scripture says the purpose of this altar of remembrance, as, as written about in Joshua 4, 6, is to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan. The waters, when they were cut off, the, the, the water, walls went up. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Come on, people. We need to tell our stories and to build our altars of remembrance so we can tell our children. Modern archaeologists have recorded these stone pillars as standing for 300,000 plus years. I want to read Deuteronomy 6. This is Dean's favorite portion of scripture. <clears throat> these are the commands, decrees, and the law 
and the laws the Lord your God directed you to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all the decrees and the commands that I give you. And so you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase in the land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your fathers promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the, is the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commands that I give you to you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You see, why were there stone altars? Because they outlive the people who build them. We need to remember and we need to establish some symbolic altars of remembrance to serve to remind future generations of God's past faithfulness in order to give them strength to continue to trust God in the midst of their trials. What we erect in our lives as a legacy of faith built on the encounters with a living God cannot be torn down. They will stand for a lifetime and for generations. Our world and our culture bombard us with noise and with images that attempt to drown out his voice, his love, his faithfulness, his goodness. The enemy of our souls, who is the father of lies, tries to deceive us, to have us believe that the, the worst about God, the worst about each other, that God is not faithful, that we are alone, and that he doesn't really care. Somehow, over time, and when new crisis arises, we forget the ways that God came through for us, or we doubt that he's going to do it again. Because it's so easy to get distracted, to get worn out, to get hard of hearing and unbelieving. It is then that we need to remember what God has done in our lives. Or we risk forgetting. In the New Testament, Luke 19, 37 to 40, we read about stones but with a new meaning. When Jesus came near a place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. The stones will cry out. Yes, that is what Jesus said. Imagine that. I am not going to be out yelled by a stone. I'm not going to be. You see, in 1 Peter 2, the Apostle Peter calls Jesus the living stone. And then he invites us, every single one of us, he says, Come on, you now be Jesus' living stones. And under the new covenant with Christ, our lives can symbolically become altars of remembrance for the world around us to see a living tribute to a loving God. We need to recall. We need to retell. We need to honor what God has done and is doing in our life. We need to memorialize his goodness and his mercy to be <clears throat> a living stone that joyfully praises God and wait with anticipation for what's to come. He keeps his promises. His love never fails. I want to show you a picture of an altar of remembrance of sorts that we have in our home. It's a framed seashell potholder. 
And I'll end today's message by telling you of its significance. It reminds Dean and I how God strengthened us when we were fearing for our very lives. You see, in about 1994, Dean and I went on a vacation to Cebu in the Philippines. We were living in Hong Kong at the time. My parents had come to visit, and we decided that the four of us would head off to a resort in Cebu and have a vacation. At the resort, we hired a private boat to take us out to do some snorkeling. And we went out about a half hour boat ride. And we got off and we were doing some snorkeling. And when we came up, my mom and dad and Dean and I, and we went to get back on the boat, the captain we had hired had been overtaken by sea pirates. They had him bound, they had knives, and they ordered us to get up and out of the water and to be still. I obliged. They then commandeered our boat and took us to a remote island, commanding us to get off the boat. People, this is a true story. And every single one of us thought we were about to be killed. My dad, he decided to use some unsightly words that he thought had a common understanding. And he made himself really big and he started roaring and yelling. And he told my mom and I, you two get back on the boat and take off. <coughs> I'm crying. I'm thinking, I'm not leaving my husband behind on this island. Dean, on the other hand, Dean has a very unique mind. He's actually quite brilliant. And one of his favorite quotes is to see what everyone sees, but to think what no one has thought. And he lived that quote in that moment. He saw the situation, but his response was so unexpected. He threw our captors off. Instead of obliging the captors and giving them our money, is what they wanted. Dean decides, I'm going on a bit of a walkabout. He just walks away from them, and they're like, what the heck's going on with this guy? You know how they say, if you're in a bad situation, be more psycho than the psycho that's got you? <laughs> Dean goes on a walkabout, and he's like, I'm not giving you my money, and I'm like, you are giving them our money. And he's like, I'm not giving you any money. And he walks into one of the, the very primitive shacks on this remote island. And he says, I want your dog. And they're like, you want my dog? He's like, I'll buy your dog. And they're like, the dog's not for sale. And they're like really thrown off by this guy. And uh, so then he just starts pulling stuff off their shelves. And they, the, you, the look on their faces, and my mom and my dad thinks Dean's totally gone off his chump. <laughs> And Dean pulls off this seashell potholder. And he says, I'll buy that. Anyway, a long story. We purchased this lovely seashell potholder for about 200 US dollars. And by doing so, we purchased our freedom. But the plot twist, we came out to find out, it was all a scam. The captain of our boat was in cahoots with the pirates. They wanted our money, but we got our potholder. <laughs> anyway, it's framed as an altar of remembrance to what? To God's faithfulness, yes. To Dean's brilliance, yes. To how God made a way when there seemed to be no way, yes. But also it, it is a memory that it links Dean and I forever to a shared place in time. Friends, today is Thanksgiving. Let's start fresh. Let's be people who remember the faithfulness of the one who loves us so much, who contends for us. Please stand with me. Today the Lord would say, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. 
if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'm going to come in. I'm going to sup with you. I'm going to get to know you. The Lord is inviting us to come into relationship with him, to remove the barrier of sin, to start new. The word of God says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Let's have a time of intimacy. Into me you see. God, we invite you to come in and see and know us in a way that our hearts are hungering and thirsting for newness for freshness, for forgiveness of sin. Lord Jesus, come. We hear you knocking. Lord, you're faithful to stir up remembrance. Stir us up, Lord. Stir us up right now, Lord. If there's anyone here today who, like me, knows that sin is separating them from experiencing and embracing an authentic relationship with the Lord. If that's you, I want to give you, I don't want you to leave without having an opportunity to respond. I remember when I heard that preacher preach. It felt like my heart was going to pound out of my chest. It felt like the butterflies that were in my stomach were about to take flight. Because I knew that God was speaking to me. If that's you today, I'd ask you just to simply lift your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. But I'd like to pray with you. If you're saying, I need a fresh start, I need my sins to be forgiven, I know that they're coming between me and God. Simply lift your hand and I'll pray. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to begin this incredible journey with you. And people, as you go today, I want you just to stir up those places of remembrance of the faithfulness of God. Can we pray together? I see your hand. Thank you. For those that have lifted their hand and said, I want to start new. I want to knock the sin out through the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, right now I stand before you. And I know that my life is messed up because of sin, that it's clouding out. It's obstructing me from being in true relationship with you. Lord, today, even as I put my hand up, I'm saying I'm making a decision to turn from that sin. I want a new life, Lord. I want a clean slate. Lord, even as your word says that we be, can become born again in this moment, Lord, would you come in like a flood, wash over me, cleanse me, and put me on a right path, Lord. Father, I submit myself to you. I'm asking for freshness. I'm asking for newness. I'm asking, Lord, and I'm submitting my life to you, making you my Lord. Father, I thank you for the incredible work you've done today. I thank you for the way that you have turned hearts and lives. Lord, I know that you who began a good work are faithful to complete it. 
So thank you. God bless you guys. If you put up your hand today, if you want more prayer, if you want to talk to us, I'll be up here. Pastor Joel may be up here. There's other people from the prayer team. But God bless you. Have an absolutely delightful week. Hey everyone, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We hope you enjoyed it and found something that spoke to you or blessed you in some way. That really is the heart of Harvest City Church, that you take what you've heard, learned, or experienced here, and then go out and share that good news with others. So go ahead and post this video to your page, start conversations, and who knows the lives that God could transform through it. If we can support you in some way in this season, please let us know. Maybe you've decided to dedicate your life fully to Jesus. We want to hear about it and celebrate with you and help you in those first steps. Connecting in to share the joys and the struggles of life is why we're here. Finding community is super important too, so if you're wondering about any of our programs for kids, youth, or adults, just reach out to us by phone or at the link below and we'll be in touch. To all of those who are partnering financially with us, thank you for your investment into the kingdom of God. It allows us to do what he's calling us to and reach even more people. For more info on that, go over to harvestconnect.ca slash give. If you haven't already, be sure to check out our live stream chat area at harvestconnect.ca slash live. It's a great place for interaction, commenting, prayer with our online hosts, and more. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our social pages and all that good stuff too. Take care, keep living your call, and we'll see you again real soon.